Hello everybody, uh, it's me again. I hope you are well and happy wherever you are in the world. This is the book that I wrote once, the first of a series about a girl called Molly Moon, who is a child hypnotist. Molly Moon's Incredible Book of Hypnotism is the name of this book. I'm about to read you chapter three. Here is a picture for you to look at today. This is by an artist called Joe Webb. I showed a picture of his the other day. I love the way it reminds me of what's going on in the world now. Well, anyway, there's lots of things always stirring the world up. But right now we've got an extra big things stirring the world up. So I love this picture and it's here for you to look at. So now I'm going to read chapter three to you. Molly blasted her way through the school woods, the wet ferny undergrowth slapping at her legs. She picked up a willowy stick and thrashed the plants. The first hairy fern she came to was Miss Addiston. Shwip! The cane zipped through the air and cut off her head. Oh, cow, Molly muttered. A dark green creeper was Edna. Shwip! Filthy old bag. She came to the base of an old yew tree. Poisonous red berries were rotting on the ground around it, and a huge yellow fungus was growing revoltingly on its trunk. Ah, Miss Toadley. Thwack, thwack. Molly felt a little better once she had sliced Mrs. Toadley into smelly bits. Notorious yourself, she said under her breath. Sitting down on a tree stump, Molly kicked at the nettle and thought about what Rocky had said. The nettle bounced back and stung her ankle. As Molly found a dock leaf, and rubbed it on the nettle sting. She thought that maybe Rocky had been right a bit, but she still felt cross with him. After all, she never nagged him. Sometimes, if he was singing one of his songs, she had to shake him to get his attention. She, however, didn't expect him to change his habits. Molly had thought Rocky liked her exactly as she was, so it was a big shock to discover that he disliked even a part of her. A bigger shock to see him side with the others. She wondered how often he'd been resentful of her without saying anything. He'd been wandering a lot off lately. Had he been avoiding her? Molly's mind burned. What had he said? But she never tried at anything. But she did try at adverts with him brilliantly. She tried at those. Maybe she should find something else to be good at. That would show him. Inside Molly was a stew of anger and worry. Molly strode off through the woods, feeling very sorry for herself and taking deep breaths to calm down. The trees cleared and she stood in the wind on the bare hillside, looking down on the small town of Briarsville. There was the school and past it the high street, the town hall, civic buildings and houses, all glistened from the afternoon rain. Cars that looked like the size of guinea pigs beetled through its snaking streets. Molly wished that one of those cars would come to pick her up, to drive her home to a cosy house. She thought how lucky other children at school were, however bad their day, they always had a friendly home to return to. Molly diverted her thoughts to the giant billboard that stood on the edge of the town displaying a different advert every month. Today the message beaming into everyone's life was Be cool. Drink Q. The picture on the huge hoarding was of a man on a beach wearing sunglasses drinking a can of Ch Cube. The famous Cube can flashed its golden and orange stripes as if Q not the sun, lit up the world. Molly liked the way it was hot looking and yet had a cool drink inside. 
beautiful beach people crowded adoringly around the man who was drinking. They all had wonderful white teeth, but the whitest teeth of all belonged to the guy with a can, with a can of cube. Molly loved the cube ads. She'd felt she'd practically walked on the white sandy beach where this one was set and knew the glamorous people who played there. How Molly longed to be transported to their fantastic world. She knew that they were actors and that the scene was fabricated, but Molly also trusted that this world of theirs existed. One day she'd escape from the misery of Hardwick House to begin a new life. A fun-filled life, like the lives of the people in her favourite adverts. But it would be real. Molly had tasted Cube once, when Mrs Trinklebury had bought in a few cans of it. But the cans had been shared and so she'd only had a few mouthfuls. With its minty, fruity taste, it certainly was different. As Molly walked down into the town, she thought how great it would be if simply drinking one can of cube could make a person popular. She'd love to be popular, like the glossy people on the poster. How Molly wished she was rich and beautiful too. As it was, she was poor, weird-looking and unpopular, and nobody. Down the hill, Molly walked towards the town library. She was fond of the old, disorganised library. It was peaceful, and its thick, photographic books gave Molly far away places to dream about. Both Rocky and Molly loved it there. The librarian was always too busy reading or sorting books to bother them. In fact, it was the one place where Molly wasn't the butt of a telling off. And she could relax in her secret place. She climbed the granite steps and passed the stone lions at the top, going into the foyer. The sweet smell of the wooden floor polish made Molly instantly feel ten times calmer. She wiped her feet and padded over to the library notice board where there were messages from the outside world. This week there was somebody trying to sell a waterbed and somebody else trying to find homes for kittens. There were notices about yoga courses, tango lessons, cooking classes and sponsored walks. The biggest notice of all was for the Briarsville talent competition the following week. This reminded her of Rocky since he was entering with one of the songs he'd written. Molly hoped he'd win, but then, remembering that she was still cross with him, she stopped herself hoping at once. Quietly she opened the door of the library itself. The librarian was sitting at her desk reading a book. She glanced up at Molly and smiled. Oh, hello, she said, her kind blue eyes twinkling through her glasses. When I saw your school anorak through the doors, I thought it was your friend. He's been in here a lot lately. It's nice to see you again. Molly smiled back. Thanks, she said. The librarian's friendliness made her feel funny. Molly wasn't used to grown-ups being kind to her. Awkwardly, she turned away from the woman's gaze and started to read the pamphlets that were stacked in front of the newspaper table, where an old lady was reading a magazine called dog show, her pig, pink rinsed hairdo glued into shape with spray. So it was to the library where Rocky had been secretly sloping off to. Molly wondered again if it was because he was trying to avoid her. Then she decided to quit worrying and she turned to look about the library. She walked towards the rows of bookshelves, borrowing a cushion from the nearby chair on her way. Molly passed along the tall aisles of books, A to C, D to e, F. The shelves were crammed with books, often too deep. Some books, Molly thought, hadn't been looked at for decades. She passed the G to I books, then the J to L, M to P, Q to S, T to W, and X to Z. Z, Molly's favourite place. The X to Z section was right at the far end of the library where the room narrowed and there was only space for a short shelf. In between the shelf and the wall was a snug place warmed by an underfloor pipe and lit by its own light bulb. 
The carpet was less worn out as hardly anybody went there because there weren't many authors or subjects that started with X, Y or Z. Occasionally people would come to that aisle for zoology or books by an author whose name began with Z, but not very often. Molly took off her anorak and lay down, her head by Y and her feet by Z, propping her head up with the cushion. The floor was warm and the distant rhythmical thudding of the building's boiler along with the librarian's soothing voice on the phone helped Molly start to breathe, breathe peacefully and soon she was lying on the floor imagining it herself floating in space again and then she drifted off. A rumpus woke her up. She had slept for about half an hour. Someone, a man with an American accent, was in a terrible temper and his gruff voice was getting louder and louder by the second. I cannot believe this, the speaker bellowed. I mean, this is unbelievable. I, I made a deal with you a few days ago on the phone. I wired you the money to rent the book, and I, I, I fly from Chicago to get it. 3,000 miles I've come, and you, meanwhile, you go and lose it. I mean, what kind of badly run institution is this? This was a very strange sensation for Molly. Someone else was getting a telling off. The librarian's wren-like voice piped up nervously. I'm really sorry, Professor Notman. I really can't think what could have happened to it. I, I saw the book with my own eyes last week. I can only assume it's been taken out by another member of the public. Although it it's always been in the restricted section, so that shouldn't have happened. Oh dear, well, let me look at the files. Molly raised herself up to peep through the shelves to see who was making the fuss. At the main desk, the librarian was frantically flicking through a box file, staring beseechingly at the cards, begging one of them to explain where the missing book had gone. Molly knew what she felt like. It's by L Logan, you said, she asked in a worried voice. Logan, the cross voice corrected her. And the title begins with H. Molly got to her knees to peer through a higher shelf to see what the man looked like. There was his middle, a barrel-like stomach in a Hawaiian shirt with palm trees and pineapples on it. Molly moved up a level. The shirt was short-sleeved and on his hairy arm, the man wore an expensive-looking gold watch. His hands were small, fat and hairy whilst his fingernails were disgustingly long. He strummed the desk impatiently. Molly moved up one more shelf. His nose was upturned and his face was round with a double chin. His black, greasy hair started halfway down back across his head and hung down to his shoulders. His beard was a small, sharp black triangle just under his bottom lip and his moustache was clipped and oiled. His eyes were bulbous and his face was sunburnt. In all he looked like a very ugly sea lion and Molly thought very unlike how she'd imagined a professor should look. So, he asked belligerently, have you found it yet? Uh, well, no, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Professor Notman. It seems that it's been lent out. It hasn't been lent out. What am I saying? It, it hasn't been lent out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this really is very embarrassing. The librarian's words, words tumbled nervously out of her mouth. She started to scrabble around in her drawer. Professor, not perhaps for now you ought to take your check back. I don't want to take my check back, boomed the ugly man. What sort of lousy librarian are you losing books? Professor Notman started to rant with fury. I want that book. I pay for that book. I'll have that book. He stormed over to the G to I aisle. Some idiot probably put it away in the wrong place. The librarian shifted nervously in her seat whilst the man waddled through the aisles, huffing and sweating. Molly could hear his angry breath. <laughs> Now he was just the other side of her bookshelf, so close that Molly could have touched him. He smelt of old chip fat and fish and tobacco. Round his rashy neck 
on a gold chain hung a scorpion medallion which nestled in his hairy chest. The golden scorpion had a diamond for an eye which caught the light and winked at Molly. The professor's pudgy, taloned finger ran menacingly along the top of the T to W books. Right, he suddenly announced. Right, it's obviously not here. So what they're going to do is this. You, he said, marching over to the desk, pointing aggressively so that his fingernail almost poked the li librarian between the eyes. You are going to check with your colleague and find out what happened to my book. As soon as you know, you'll call me. The warthoggy man pulled a snakeskin wallet from his back pocket and out of that a business card. He wrote something on the back of it. I'm staying at the Briarsville Hotel. You will telephone me and keep me updated. And you will get that book back in here as a matter of priority. I need this book for very important scientific research. My museum will be horrified to hear how it has been mislaid, although they shan't hear of this, of course, if you find it. Have I made myself clear? Yes, Professor. The Professor then picked up a sheepskin coat and, grunting angrily, left the library. The librarian lit, bit her lip and then started adjusting the pins in her bun. Outside, the main doors banged shut. Molly leaned back on her knees. In front of her, a big Y denoted the beginning of the Y shelves. Why? 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 Why was that ugly man so keen to get that book? He had said that he had paid to rent it out, even though it was from a, a book from the not to be lent out section and he'd come a long way for it. it must be a very interesting book more interesting molly supposed than yachting or yodeling or hypnotism hypnotism molly looked at the book in front of her its cover had been ripped so that the first letter of the title had been removed in a blinding flash Molly realised that the missing letter had been an H. Quickly, she pulled the heavy leather bound book from the shelf and checking furtively that no one was watching, she opened the cover. There, in old-fashioned type, were the words Hypnotism, an ancient art explained by Dr. H. Logan. Published by Arkwright and Sons, 1908. Molly didn't need to look any further. She quietly shut the book, wrapped it in her anorak, and while the librarian was reading under her desk, in a cupboard, at something, Molly left the library too. And that, that, was the second strange So, that's the end of chapter two. And um, so wherever you are, keep well and try to keep happy and be kind and happy hypnotizing.